Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dan Truckee. I'm director of the Bowmere UP Heritage Center. If you're just joining us now for uh, our session on folk music in the UP. Um, this is near and dear to my heart, being both a folklorist and folk musician and a historian. Um, and growing up in, in the, the, the world that these guys are going to talk about, because the musicians and the music that they're going to talk about affected me and still affect me today and many people in the UP. Um, but the, the wonderful thing about this is that neither of them live here. They are scholars from other parts of America, which just shows you how special the UP is, that we have these two scholars from other parts of America talking to us about folk music. Um, uh, we, I'm going to introduce them, then they're going to do their presentations. If you have any questions, type them into the Q&A function down at the bottom of the screen, and uh, we'll, at the end, have a Q&A session using those questions. So uh, please do, and uh, I hope you'll have a lot to ask these guys. Uh, Dr. James P. Leary is a folklorist and emeritus professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he co-founded the Center for the Study of Upper Michigan, or Upper Midwestern Cultures. Um, his field in archival research in Michigan's UP since the 1970s has contributed to numerous publications and productions, including the Grammy nominated folk songs of Another America, field recordings from the Upper Midwest, 1937-1946, which if you don't have a copy, you sh I'm pretty sure you can still get one somewhere, but it's an amazing resource and well worth uh, the uh, the expense. So, uh, and then our second speaker will be Carl Rockinen, who is a music librarian and professor at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. His research interests have included Baltic uh, psalteries, fiddling traditions, polka bands, and more recently Scandinavian and Finnish American music. In 2017, he enjoyed a sabbatical visiting archives in the upper Midwest in Finland and interviewing Finnish American musicians plays classical, popular, and folk music in a variety of ensembles. And you can find out more about him at uh, the uh, people at iup.edu rockinen. So um, gentlemen, thank you. And we're gonna start off with uh, Mr. Leary. Jim, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. And is, is my, my screen is showing, I assume? It is, it is showing. Okay, so well, this is the, like if a tree falls in the forest, uh, you know, does anyone hear it? And so the question is, uh, there is folk music in the UP, but who, who is who has heard it? Uh, and then who who documents it? Who leaves a, a record behind? And um, it's the insiders, of course, who uh, know that it's going on, but haven't until recently done the documentation. And if we look historically, at least, uh, what do we find as uh, fragments of, of evidence, documentary evidence of folk music in the UP? Uh, photographs, mostly without what archivists call metadata, you know, the who, the what, the when, the where, uh, sometimes it's randomly there, but, or incomplete. Uh, sometimes there are newspaper ads and, and stories that, uh, that come, come through. Uh, nowadays with search engine, you can find them. There are occasionally uh, locally published so-called ephemeral or elusive uh, small run uh, pamphlets, uh, songbooks and the like. People put together their own personal notebooks or have and scrapbooks. A few um, in the early part of the 20th century, people from the UP uh, musicians actually left the region to make recordings in, in New York City, but continued to perform in the, in the region. Uh, and then, of course, insiders through their experiences and memories, uh, you know, they create their own internal documentation of the, the music, uh, but unless it's recorded, uh, it, it vanishes. Uh, and consciousness about the significance of the traditions are, are mostly locally based. And this is, uh, this is I would say, on ongoing. And just some examples of this kind of insider documentation. You know, here's a wonderful photo from the early 20th century in Delta County with some uh, loggers, uh, maybe something for medicinal purposes being poured on, on the left. Uh, we have a, a record player. We don't know what the record is on there. Uh, three row, or two, two row button accordion. And uh, maybe the guy on the right is uh, 
you know, using a tray for percussion, hard to know for sure. We know a little more about this photo from the mid 1930s. Uh, this was a group that called themselves Curly Bradley and the Hard Cider Boys. Uh, Curly B Bradley was actually a, a Western performer who wasn't from the UP, but uh, uh, this fellow with the fiddle was pretending to be <laughs> Curly Bradley uh, in a kind of a vogue in the 30s of local people imitating uh, radio barn dance stars from Chicago's WLS barn dance and elsewhere. And uh, this was a group that was active in the Ironwood area. Phil, Phil Cassera, who um, produced the North Country Folk Festival back in the late 70s and early 80s and had a picture framing shop. Uh, this was a, a relative of his, Curly Bradley. He was a Slovak uh, in the upper left and lower right. It looks like probably a couple of Italian guys. And I think the other three are, are Finns playing some kind of uh, polka billy music, probably, but we don't really know. We have little scraps, uh, newspaper shards uh, here the, on the left, the Barn Dance Jubilee. Uh, these are from, from Ironwood and, and Ironwood and Bessemer newspapers. You can search them through uh, some, some search engines nowadays. Uh, we find names of groups. So, sometimes uh, you see Hiram Perkins Barn. Uh, you know, you have these kind of uh, Yankee uh, and uh, Southern and Anglo-American names that people are are taking on, but if you look at their names, they're you know they're Poles and Finns and Cro Croatians and uh, maybe in a few cases some Cornish or something like that. Um, over on the right, this was a newspaper clipping uh, from the Keweenaw. There was a Keweenaw barn dance with a, a bunch of performers, uh, Croatians, Finns, Swedes, uh, and, and uh, Cousin Jack as, as well, and including the, the Floriani family. And we'll see a little clip of them a little bit later on. But we have these little scraps of, of evidence or uh, on the right, uh, Rudy Kempa, who uh, for a long time uh, in the 30s, uh, I think even into the, the late 70s, uh, maybe maybe longer, ha had a, a radio program, finished radio program out of Hancock. And at one point he put out a little pamphlet of uh, most requested songs, of uh, Finnish songs uh, with, with lyrics. And then people put together their own um, little notebooks Sylvia Polso as, as a schoolgirl in uh, sixth grade in 1922 in Ironwood uh, did this uh, her diamond composition book with Orpapoy and Valsi or Orphan Boys Waltz a, a Finnish song she had other ones in there like uh, uh, Vili Rusu and uh, Vapa Venaya this uh, kind of stirring uh, uh, anti-imperialistic uh, working class song and then she uh, later by the the 20 uh, later in the 1920s uh, toured with uh, Viola Turpin and Yuka Rosendahl that Carl will be talking about and this is a fragment from her her scrapbook that among other things shows a caricature of Turpin and, and some of the places where they're playing their gigs in, in the UP and uh, these were the the three performers that I'm aware of doing kind of folk ethnic vernacular roots music from the UP who ventured to New York City to make commercial recordings. And on, on the left, uh, there we do see Sylvia Polso with her piano accordion in the middle, uh, John or Yuka Rosendahl and, and the great Viola Thurpin. And uh, in the middle, uh, less known, but a very good band from Caspian, the, the Mackey Trio that made a number of uh, 78 RPM recordings. And then the, the Finnish American Woody Guthrie uh, Hiski Saloma, who for a while was a was a tailor uh, and living in, in in South Range in in the uh, uh, Copper Country, uh, outsiders began to document uh, music in the UP uh, as early as 1919, and um, typically their documentation is more purposeful. Uh, involves field notes, little accounts of their uh, travels. Uh, sometimes they transcribe 
lyrics uh, and, and tunes. Often they provide brief, sometimes just too brief, just the name and the place and when the person was born, but sometimes more biographies of performers. Uh, sometimes they, they do photographs, uh, even film with, uh, with metadata information about the who, the what, the when, the where, but that isn't always there. Uh, and certainly from the uh, 1930s on, uh, these outsiders made feel recordings, sound recordings, uh, and then all of them parlayed their documentary work into some kinds of publication in the form of essays or books or record albums or radio features. Um, they also left behind legacies uh, that resulted in archival collections, some of which are becoming increasingly accessible nowadays. And um, their interest in the region was really part of a larger interest in what was going on within a either a bigger upper Midwestern region or within a national and even an international context. But of course, their coming and, and going into the UP was, was sporadic. Uh, in, in the early 1980s, uh, 1981, I had the pleasure of meeting Oren Tikkanen for the first time. And in 87, he, uh, I did a little field work. Uh, actually, it was 86, I did the field work and then in 87, he was featured during the Michigan sesquicentennial um, among, along with others playing um, at the National Mall in Washington, DC for the Smithsonian's Festival of American Folk Life. And uh, he, uh, one of the gigs uh, that he played, he entertained uh, the audience and I think needled me <laughs> in a good natured way with this brilliant uh, quote saying, you know, it's, it's a beautiful time now in the UP. And this is the time when every summer we look forward to the, the annual migration of the folklorist, you know, kind of coming in like geese or something of, of the sort. But the first person to uh, come into the UP, uh, kind of hitchhiking and tramping through, uh, you see one of a photograph he made of, of uh, uh, really tar paper shacks uh, in, in a logging area was uh, a fellow from Galesburg, Illinois, um, who had worked for a while as the master of caddies at a golf course in Charlevoix. And then he crossed over into the UP uh, and traipsed through there and he encountered a few songs. His name was Franz Rickaby. And in 19, the mid 1920s, he published the first really good book on lumberjack folk songs. And here we see a, a little uh, snippet of, of a song that he recorded in, in Moran, Michigan in, in the Eastern UP. And there he is uh, on, on, on the right. Uh, it was quite a few years later before the next outsider came to do documentation. In, in 1938, almost 20 years later, uh, the noted uh, folklorist, ethnomusicologist, uh, Alan Lomax uh, made a trek, uh, really was very much interested in adding uh, kind of songs of Great Lakes workers and, and lumberjacks to some of the popular collections that he and his father were doing on American folk song. But he also was very much aware of uh, the ethnic diversity in the region. And prior to traveling, he uh, acquired this, this map uh, that shows the UP uh, with little uh, uh, shaded areas indicating the presence of uh, Finnish Americans or Irish or uh, Scottish or French Canadian. Uh, he's got different uh, uh, areas that were outlined. Most of them are, 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 are Finnish that he that are described as, as fins on here. And here we see a photo of him from around 1940 when he was producing national radio programs, as well as a view uh, from around that time from Amasa, a place that he was quite impressed with. And uh, he kept little notebooks and the Library of Congress has these on the left. Uh, well, I don't know if it's on your left, but it's on mine. You can see a little description from September 22nd, 1938, uh, describing Amasa, a clean little 
town, uh, gray and deserted surrounding the Finnish co-op. The people are grave, intelligent, well-informed. Uh, like other Finns I've met, the old songs are going, but the intelligence persists, et cetera, et cetera. And he, he mentions some people. Uh, then he sometimes just has uh, little names and addresses. Vladimir, Vladimir Floriani, who was someone we saw in that Kiwanaw barn dance clipping earlier. Uh, here are his French contacts, a couple of whom he uh, did a lot of extensive recording with, including Mose and Exilia Belair uh, in, in Bariga, and also in, in Champion, a guy named Fred Carrier. And here we see a description of Newberry. And if, if, you, were, uh, if you were at the, the prior uh, presentation that John Beck made, uh, this was a year after the Finnish Hall had been burned. Um, Newberry, the toughest little town, uh, I've seen in Michigan, Larson's Loose Hotel, the Young Loafers football players, fighters around the dreary bar, potential fascists, uh, boasting about how the strikers had beaten up, uh, uh, the, uh, beaten up the Finnish workers hall. Uh, we showed them reds, et, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he took with him, uh, it's rather amazing, uh, at the time, very new, uh, Technicolor film camera, silent film camera, lugging it around along with a massive disc cutting uh, machine and a big bulky microphone and blank discs. And uh, here on the left are the Floriani uh, Tamboritsons. Here on the right, uh, Exil the French singer. And he was very impressed about uh, the UP. He felt there was enough work there for uh, years, years of uh, documentation, although he certainly never returned to, to the area. But the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress, and these are online, they have uh, finding aids about Michigan collections there that include not only uh, little details about uh, Lomax's collections, uh, his recordings, but also those of, of Henry Welliver, who came a little over a decade later, and I'll say a little more about him in, in a moment. Um, the exciting thing to me uh, in 1981, when I started to do fieldwork, some of the people recorded by Lomax were still around. On the left, uh, John Schaubitz, his name was mis misspelled as Schaubitz uh, on um, the Library of Congress's card. But uh, here he is playing with Bill Koskala in, in Ironwood in 1981 at a little uh, festival gig at uh, the North Country Folk Festival that I was able to set up. And as Dan mentioned, uh, there is a lot of uh, Lomax's UP recordings, uh, selections therefrom and elaborated uh, biographies. Uh, and the book is available. All of the recordings um, are available free on, online uh, along with the film. Uh, and the Library of Congress has gone on to uh, uh, put all of Lomax's Michigan and uh, Wisconsin recordings online so you can listen to them as the old Alan Lomax uh, collection. You can browse or search. Uh, a decade later, 1949, Henry Welliver, born in Pennsylvania, he was teaching in, in, in Minot in, in North Dakota, uh, you know, pretty close to where Franz Rickaby ended up teaching, a music educator. He eventually um, landed in, in Michigan, uh, where he was uh, involved with a number of um, organizations. Uh, I may skip over this recording because I'm worried about running out of time, but if we have time later, I can come, come back and play just a, a snatch of, uh, of a song. He was mostly interested in Cornish songs, and um, Dan... Trucky actually shared this stuff with me. And so he, I think, knows more about this than, than I do. Uh, another person who did field work, uh, actually without really venturing in, into the UP was Gertrude Prokash Kurath, who was a dance ethnologist. Uh, and uh, in the early 1950s and 53, she recorded a guy named Thomas Chalifo, who was, uh, who was French uh, Ojibwe uh, enrolled at Barriga, but was living in the lower peninsula. Uh, he'd been a, a lumber camp worker and fiddler. Uh, he sang uh, Catholic hymns in Ojibwe, but did, did old, older traditional songs as well. And some of them are on her folkways 
recordings that um, the Smithsonian has now taken over and is still available. In 81, I, I set out on a trip with funding from the National Endowment for the Arts uh, and um, setting out from Washburn, Wisconsin, and had a lot of exciting and delightful times, including one at the Pelto Brothers Farmstead in Boston location, a couple of Finnish bachelors. This was in March. They were uh, using their sauna rather actively. You could see their underwear hanging up and uh, along with the Polish shower and the Finlanders snowblower. And uh, here, here is Eddie uh, Pelto playing the piano accordion and Mati uh, playing the button accordion. Well, here, just a little snatch here. Oops. Uh, my case over here. No, no, that was uh, his girlfriend, Sherry. Sherry said, oh, Matt, my dad used to play that number. She said, but he's gone. He's... And she started bawling. I said, well, I ain't going to play anything that we, that is going to hurt you. I said, no, no, play it, play it. He said, Uh, and so for this, uh, my partner, recording partner on there, uh, Matt Gallman, wrote up field notes. And then uh, later I, I did um, an index of, of the recording. And all of that field work uh, from the UP with, with Croatians and Italians and uh, Finns and other folks is now online through the University of Wisconsin's Mills Music Library, a site called Ethnic Music of Northern Wisconsin and, and Michigan. And uh, here, just a few other images, an Italian group from the Bessemer Wakefield area in 1981. I'm setting up the mic for them. Um, and later I was able to do field work with the Michigan Traditional Arts Program at Michigan State with the Smithsonian Institution, and also with, with Michael Lokanen of, of, of Marquette and Up North Films and NMU. That's a photo I made at the, the Barriga uh, Pow, pow wow um, in the late 1980s. Um, now, since, since the early 80s, insiders in the UP uh, have taken over really the, the, the function of prior outsiders in documenting local traditions and foremost among them has been Michael Lokanen, who's uh, looked a lot at uh, uh, kind of French Indian fiddling and step dancing as well as Powwow music, Finnish music, uh, Croatians, lumberjack music. Uh, and he's made a number of films uh, here with Jingo Vashan uh, and here with Jim Williams from Lac Vue de Zaire, a great uh, drum, drum song singer. And he's currently working uh, on, on a film on music from the UP that should be uh, ready uh, probably in the, in the new year. Oren Tikkanen uh, has also, since the early 1980s, been doing a lot of great music, but also great documentary work, uh, producing recordings with, uh, with Al Recco, uh, and also producing recordings from a couple of late and wonderful people and fiddlers, uh, Helmer Theuros and Ed La Laoluma. Uh, so um, that's my quick tour through uh, insiders and outsiders and the documentation of uh, folk music in, in the UP. And I thank you in some of the languages of the, the performers from, from the region. So that's my spiel. That was great, Jim. We got a chance to discuss things now or no we'll we'll discuss everything at the end everything at the end okay it's all yours carl excellent presentation okay well mine's about 20 minutes so let me share my screen here and can you see it yep we can see yeah. it Okay, just so I don't embroider here, I thought I would, uh, I have a formal paper that I'll read, but we can, you can stop and ask any, any time along the way. Oops. 
Vila Turpinen is probably the best known Finnish American musician of all time. In the space of only two years from 1926 to 1928, a talented but unknown teenager from Iron River, Michigan became a star of the piano accordion world with an internationally recognized music career. She had a great impact from the late 1920s to the 1950s, both in her many performances at Finn Halls throughout the United States, as well as from her compositions and sound recordings. Turpinen and those who performed with her are the most extensively documented Finnish American musicians. Although her name does not appear in any major music encyclopedia or dictionary, there are scholarly articles, newspaper articles, and she's been mentioned prominently in books on American ethnic music. The most comprehensive biography remains liner notes to a four CD collection of her recorded works. In addition to the published material, we are very fortunate to have significant primary sources. Viola Turpinen and her playing companions, John Rosenthal, Sylvia Polso, and William Suriela kept scrapbooks, diaries, music, and other documentations of their experiences in the 1920s and early 1930s. Today, copies of these materials are located in various archives, but they can easily be studied through digital copies. These primary sources help greatly in documenting the lives of these musicians. The basic facts of Viola Torpenin's life are well known. Uh, she was born in Champion, Michigan in 1909. Her father came from Kivijärvi, Finland, and immigrated with his parents to Michigan in 1890. Her mother, Signe Irene Vitala, was born in Champion in 1892. Jingo Vitala Vashon, the great storyteller, artist, and musician from Toivola, Michigan, was actually Viola Torpenin's first cousin on her mother's side. Soon after Viola was born, uh, the family moved to Iron River, Michigan, where her father worked in the mines. Both her parents played two-row accordion and an uncle, Emil Turpinen, was an excellent player. Viola showed musical talent and also learned to play button accordion. With the button accordion, Viola was a genuine folk musician, learning by ear the tunes that her family members played. But the family lived across the street from the Italian-American Bruno Hall, where they could regularly hear the strains of piano accordion. Viola's earliest introduction on the piano accordion came from, or her earliest instruction on piano accordion came from Italian Americans, and she developed into an excellent player at a young age. This is the earliest known photograph of Viola with a piano accordion. She's standing next to her teacher, Jay Bonchi, and these were probably the students in his private studio. In the 1920s, the piano accordion was just coming into its own with private studio instruction across the country. This instruction was similar to that of piano studios, which had been around for decades. Students learned to read sheet music and they worked on progressively more challenging pieces. The studios uh, not only gave instruction, but they also sold sheet music and the accordions. It is what Miriam Jacobson in her uh, calls the accordion industrial complex in her book, Squeeze This. Being able to read music and play more challenging pieces in a variety of styles began the transformation of Viola Torpinen into a professional musician. It is safe to say that without John Rosenthal, Viola Torpinen would probably have remained an obscure teenage accordionist unknown outside the Upper Peninsula. Rosenthal was born as Hugo Hemming Viren on May 22nd, 1891 in Elimaki, Finland. He immigrated to the United States in 1908 at the age of 17 with his brother Yalmer, who was five years older. I saw their immigration record and they were going to uh, the Sioux up there in Canada. That was their final destination. We know little about his life between 1908 and 1926, but by the time he starts writing in his first diary, he was an accomplished violinist who was trying to establish a performing career. In the winter and spring of 1926, he was living in Chicago, painting signs during the day and playing gigs at night. He was a talented illustrator as shown by the freehand drawings in his diaries, which uh, would have served him well as a sign maker. 
John was also a hard-driven businessman and kept careful track of all his earnings and expenses. He probably learned about the entertainment business from vaudeville, which was very popular at the time. Although he mostly played dances, his diary mentioned that he accompanied Vaina Olila in vaudeville in 1926. The Olilas, uh, Vaina Olila and his wife were unicyclists and I guess jugglers as well. As in vaudeville tradition, Rosenthal was far more than just a musician. He was a full-fledged entertainer. His diaries were full of jokes and interesting stories, which he may have collected from other performers or, or may have made up himself. He translated some of the best ones into Finnish if the joke would make sense. These jokes were full of puns, satire, and sexual innuendo. For example, why should I get married? I have a friend who has a wife. And, and maybe my favorite joke was, the British should give Ireland back to the Irish, Jerusalem back to the Jews, and Finland should give Duluth back to the United States. He did not limit his performances just to Finnish halls, but would perform them just about any place that would offer payment. This is a standard publicity photograph that he used, but it was only later that I discovered that it is a tightly cropped version of a larger photograph. So here's the larger photograph on the left. It's a newspaper clipping, and it shows a banjo lying on the table. And it was only recently that I asked myself, yes, but what kind of banjo? It was the four string tenor banjo, which was just beginning to be used in jazz and dance bands in the 1920s. This kind of banjo could be tuned in fifths, the same as a violin, and could be used to play melody lines as well as chordal accompaniment. It could be played with a single pick like a guitar rather than thumb and finger picks used in other American banjo styles. Tunes learned on the violin could easily be transferred to the tenor banjo, which would have the timbre, volume, and drive to compete with any other instrument. In playing both the violin and banjo, Rosenthal was able to preserve tradition while at the same time look forward to the popular American music of the time. In a scrapbook diary that's in, in Hancock on May 15, 1926, he writes, quote, be popular, learn to play the tenor banjos, like, like finding a golden nugget I was looking for. Although he could play melodies on the tenor banjo, he apparently wanted to learn more of the things that banjo could do. On August 6th, 1926, in his uh, Migration Institute diary, he writes, first banjo lesson, new interest in life. And on August 10th, banjo lesson today, practiced four hours. This was just days before his tour to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and meeting Viola Turpinen. He teamed up with accordionist named Isaac Mikula to play dozens of engagements in the summer of 1926. Several newspaper ads pasted into the Hancock diary read, Mikula and Rosenthal, program of uh, Finnish, Russian, and American numbers. The engagements were generally billed as Iltama Yatansi or Concert de Yatansi Ilta, or if they were in English, vaudeville and a dance. In other words, a concert program, including jokes and stories, followed by a dance. An entry on August 17th, 1926 said, quote, we left Duluth for a four week trip to Michigan. The entry on August 26th, 1926 said, met new playing pal, Viola Turpinen, 50-50 basis. This is apparently the date when John and Viola first met. He was 35 and she was still just 16 years old. For the remainder of that summer, John played several nights a week in various fin halls all over the Upper Peninsula, and he certainly played many of these gigs with Viola Turpinen, but also he must have played some of them with Isaac Mikula. Probably due to her young age, Viola returned to her home in Iron River after each engagement. At least this is the, in the newspaper article by Vienna Lina William Suriela. Uh, uh, said that. So I would assume that it's oral history that uh, Viola had said that to her husband. His last gig with Mikula happened on Sunday, September 12, 1926 in Ashland, Wisconsin. There was even a photograph in the diary of Turpinen and Mikula together, apparently from that time. Viola became a sensation with her youthful beauty and virtuosic accordion technique. Teaming up with Viola truly changed John's life since he became a successful concert promoter and it changed Viola's life in that she became well known in the Finnish American community. They made good money for the time playing numerous engagements for ever larger audiences. 
They lived in Chicago the winter of 1926-1927 and performed dances frequently at Liberty Hall. It's a precursor to the one shown in this photograph because this, this Liberty Hall was, was built in 1930. And they also played at least once a week out there in Waukegan which is a little bit of a drive from Chicago, but that's the Finn Hall that's in Waukegan where they played. And they played every single week at a place called Schmidt Hall, S-C-H-M-I-T-D, which was probably not a Finnish hall at all. The most significant thing we learn about their time in Chicago was that they both were taking lessons and practicing their instruments. The December 10th entry reads, Viola Book Lessons All Over Chicago. On December 13th, it reads, Chicago Banjo Institute lesson every Monday, wonderful standards. And on December 20th, lesson at 11, good on the banjo. I'm learning fast now, show tonight, practice all day, learn very fast. The important thing about being in Chicago for Viola is that she studied with Leo Persanti of the Accordion Institute of Chicago and learned to play especially difficult accordion pieces. Persanti was one of the first to establish an accordion school in the United States, starting in Chicago in 1920. He published his own accordion music and sold accordions, being an artist representative of the Excelsior Accordion Company. They made him an accordion uh, with his name embossed, as can be seen on the cover of his sheet music. This is just an enlargement there on the right of the center of that sheet music. In September of 1927, Viola and John started a tour towards the East Coast, playing gigs in Illinois, Ohio, Massachusetts, before arriving on January 3rd, 1928 in New York City. There was a vibrant Finnish American community there with Finn Halls in Harlem and Brooklyn, Finnish Lutheran congregations, shops, and newspapers. Soon after arriving in New York, they were hired to play dances at the socialist Finn Hall in Harlem, called the Duavanthala, or more commonly, just the Fifth Avenue Hall. They also played in Brooklyn and Jersey City, New Jersey. They met with Arthur Kulander and must have also met many other Finnish American musicians who were active in New York at the time. You can see the cursor here. Here's the Fifth Avenue Hall or the Socialist Hall, 126th and Fifth Avenue. Around the corner was the Duatempeli, which was the Communist Hall. And the IWW Hall, which is the Tharmo Hall, was right here on this corner. So could you imagine standing on that corner and being able to throw a rock and hit any of those three halls from three different workers associations? That's pretty amazing. For Viola, the most important thing about being in New York was to study with the most renowned piano accordion teacher of the time, Pietro Deiro. Pietro should not be confused with his older brother Guido Deiro, nor should he be confused with Pietro Froscini, another famous Italian-American accordionist of the same era. Those three men were all born within two years of each other. Guido Deiro, who's pictured here on the left, was believed to be the first to play piano accordion professionally in America and became a major star in vaudeville, even marrying his fellow vaudevillian Mae West. He primarily had, was interested in being a performer and he was based on the West Coast. Pietro, on the other hand, was more interesting, interested in the burgeoning accordion business and he was based in New York. His store in Manhattan sold instruments, lesson packages and arranged and published accordion music, eventually becoming the largest publisher of accordion music. He organized accordion ensembles and promoted concerts and recitals. They found the best accordionist to sponsor, who in turn would increase business. In Viola Turpinen, he found a talented, vivacious young woman, an ideal person to develop into an accordion star. On January 11, 1928, John and Viola recorded four selections for Columbia and were paid $35 for each selection. Just over two weeks later, on January 30th, they recorded six selections for Victor, the same company used by Pietro Dero and they were paid $50 a selection. John had met several times with Pietro in January 1928 to make these connections. Just as Leo Persandi in Chicago, Pietro Dero was an artist representative of the Excelsior Accordion Company headquartered in New York. Excelsior sought out the best players for whom they made highly ornamented or accordions with their names embossed on the front. This was a tradition and image of accordionists who performed in vaudeville, and Excelsior uh, considered it excellent advertising for their instruments. On the very same day she recorded for Victor, Viola picked up 
such an accordion with her name spelled out. It was part of building an image of a modern young woman with the hair and clothing styles of the time. After all, it was the Roaring Twenties. And Viola Turpinen's image was that of an accordion playing flapper or a movie star at the end of the silent era, an image that would serve well for concert and record promotion. How old was Viola when these photographs were taken? The answer is just 18 years old. She was one of the few stars of piano accordion who was a woman and the first well-known Finnish American musician who was born in America. Almost all the others from that era were immigrants. Viola Turpinen was an American teenager from the Upper Peninsula who became an accordion star in New York City. Her image was captured in caricature used in advertisements and even on the tickets sold to her events. These caricatures were probably drawn by John Rosenthal himself, since they are similar in style to his other drawings in his diaries. I always assumed that when John and Viola moved to New York, that it became their home, but the diaries tell an entirely different story. Between 1926 and 1929, they spent most of their time touring the country. Their first visit to New York was only for about a month, after which they left on a 10 month tour through Massachusetts, around the Great Lakes and to the Upper Peninsula of the Midwest and all the way up to Canada. On their way back, they lived for three months in Detroit and another month in Massachusetts before, before returning to New York. They were there only about a month before leaving on a three month tour of Finland. After returning from Finland, they were in New York only about two weeks before heading west again on another performing tour. During this era, they lived in hotels and boarding houses and were more visitors to New York than residents. So how was Viola Turpin an, an insider and how was she an outsider in New York? She was an insider in that already by the age of 18, she was a highly trained professional musician. Part of an article in Fort William News Journal in July 12, 1928 reads, her repertory includes popular and classical Finnish, Swedish, and American numbers. It is said that her interpretation of these is remarkably beautiful, the magnificent instrument which she uses responding sympathetically to her every mood. The success which has attended this young artist makes well worth the thousands of dollars expended on her education, and she should prove a strong feature on the program." End quote. She had invested in herself by studying with the best teachers of the time. This also gave her the proper connections to advance her career, such as recording for Victor Records, and she also toured both nationally and internationally. She was an outsider by being a Finnish-American teenager. Certainly, she fit into the substantial Finnish community in New York, but she was American-born and younger than most of the immigrants living there. Her performing image was created based on vaudeville and the popular fashions of the time. The diaries tell us that most of her performances were at smaller venues where people could get to know her personally. In a sense, she was the 1920s equivalent of Frankie Yankovic, who also built a national following from many small local venues. Only a few years later, about six or seven years later, by the mid 1930s, there's a completely different image of Viola Torpinen. The flapper movie star image was gone and in its place was a softer, more realistic image. She signed both of these publicity photographs with Beth, best wishes, your daughter Viola, May 12th, 1935. And on the right, your daughter Viola uh, Suriela, September 11th, 1934. Perhaps recognizing her age difference with the Finnish immigrants. These photos show a continuing evolution of her image, obviously taken the same day she has a flower in her hair she signs both of them as Mrs. Viola Turpain and Suryala. She was happily married to fellow musician William Suryala in 1933. And they performed together for the rest of her life, still touring every year to the upper Midwest from which they both had come. She also understood the power and importance of using her name in their publicity. Even after Viola and Bill retired to Florida in the 1950s, Viola always remembered and honored her fans throughout her life. As evidence of this, they sent out hundreds of Christmas cards to sustain the many personal friendships they had with their fans. This is one of the last photographs taken of Viola. It is most likely at her 49th birthday on November 15, 1958. 
She died just one month later on December 26th. Nearly 111 years after her birth, Viola's legacy still lives on in Finnish Americana. Thank you. Thanks, Carl and Jim. It leaves us a lot of time for questions, so that's good. It sure does. I, I, no one's written any, um, so we could just have more of a discussion until someone actually signed. Oh, we do have a Q&A here. Uh, it says, thank you both for these incredible talks. It's huge pleasure to hear you both talk about folk songs of the UP with such clarity and with such conviction. Might you elaborate on the purpose of Finn Halls and how the average worker would use them who owned and ran them. Thank you. You want to take a stab at it, Jim, or yeah. do you want me? Go ahead, Carl. Well, the, the thing is this, is that the more I, I study this, the more I understand that the, the uh, fin halls were basically uh, labor halls. And they were oriented either towards socialist, communist, or IWW. And the, the hall fins were not overtly religious that I could find. For example, they don't make a big deal about having a party on Christmas or, or the New Year's parties. Yes, they did have, at least from going by the diaries and what gigs they played. So uh, those, that was the organizational thing. At the same time, I'm sure that the Finnish communities had churches that were just as vibrant as the halls were. But they had a different different type of music that they did there, and they kept a kind of a different calendar. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll also say I, I think in some of the rural areas that were you know less densely populated uh, and could not support uh, you know you know three different kind of uh, <laughs> sec sectarian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sometimes they function a little more as as, as community halls. Uh, yeah. Bark Point uh, near Herbster, for example, there was a, a Finnish hall that local people made in Iron River, Wisconsin. And I, I think some of those were, um, you know, more associated some, some with the, the cooperative movement that had a, you know, a, a bigger tent or to the extent that they were socialist or communist, they were small s and small, small c, so, so to speak. But it's it's very evident uh, if we look at, uh, I know Sylvia Polso's little notebooks, or nowadays if you did a newspaper search on newspapers.com and put in the name Viola Thurpin, and uh, you would find uh, little gigs listed at all of these little tiny halls. And there was a search. Yeah. Uh, you know, Fitchburg, Massachusetts, and the ones in New York City, uh, Finger Lakes in New York, Ashtabula, Ohio, but then all through the UP, across northern Wisconsin, up into uh, northern Minnesota, and even extending as far as uh, Butte and Rock Springs, Montana, and then, of course, certainly in, in the Pacific Northwest, all, well, all up and down from, from northern California all the way up into uh, Van Vancouver, BC, there were these, these halls and uh, often with uh, plays, of course, very, very active. Uh, there was this old Finnish institution of the, the is it Il Iltima? Uh, yeah. Something like that. Uh, That's you know, a soiree or a night party. Yeah, so, so there would be, uh, recitations, uh, you know, poetry reading, songs, little performances, uh, sometimes uh, uh, debates on particular topics. And um, so, you know, they were in many ways multi-purpose community halls. And it was very interesting that Carl, of course, mentioned uh, Viola first playing at the, the Italian hall because in these working class areas, you know, people may, um, May have sustained there uh, through through churches or certain organizations some of their you know distinctly e ethnic uh, uh, affiliations, but they also as as fellow workers or uh, people in the same agrarian community or something like that, uh, you know they 
they got together at in at one another's doings and obviously learn songs and tunes and, and repertoires and techniques from from one another as as well. Let me let me add a little to the hall thing here. Uh, the halls themselves, I think, were were sponsored by the organizations that they were, but. I know this from my personal experience, they were open to the whole community. And I know that because in, in Brooklyn, where my, my grandparents had, had immigrated, they lived in the co-op. And my granddad used to go down to Imatra Hall, which was the so which was the socialist hall down there. Okay. And I said, Granddad, you're not a socialist. He he fought on the side of the whites in the Finnish uh, Civil War. And he says, that's where all my buds are down there. We don't talk politics. We just go down there for the dances or for the social things, you see. Now, what's fascinating to me was that, uh, that Viola Turpin and John uh, Rosenthal, they never played once at Imatra Hall, which is the oldest one, that at least the diaries don't say so. They played at Kalava Hall, which was a slightly different flavor again. And again, that, that image having the three halls, well, you know, uh, Jim, we have this little village of Bruce Crossing, and we have the halls right across the, the co-op right across the street from the halls, <laughs> and they were two different groups of people, right, that didn't always get along. Yeah, yeah. That Jim Leary, uh, not Jim, uh, uh, Jim uh, Curti. Curti says to me, he says, well, we church people used to listen to the dance music. We loved the, <laughs> you know, from the distance. We couldn't go up there and dance. So that was kind of the, the, the oral tradition of it. But it, it was definitely a network, kind of like the vaudeville theaters. Many of these halls had a theater in them and they did plays, they did music. That was pretty formal. And there's that whole huge collection of the worker society music, the Duemia society music. And, and I went through that and finally looked at it very carefully and saw what's the difference between that and the dance music. Well, the dance music is more informal. It's kind of party music and so on. But when, when they did these serious plays, they, they, um, they had incidental music to them and the choir music. Again, it's, it's, it was more formalized. Any other questions? Well, I, uh, my, um... My grandmother taught in one room schoolhouses in the early 20s in Rock. And mm. uh, she told me about, she had a boyfriend who, she says she didn't really, wasn't that fond of him, but he had a car. <laughs> and uh, Saturday night, she would come and pick him up and they they would go to the Finn Hall in Rock, which is still there. That I mean, it's not open to yeah. the public, but the building's still there. And uh, and she would dance, and I and I said, so you know, I was a young guy when she told me about this. And I'm like, oh, tell me about all the politics, you know, and the radicalism. And she goes, oh, they were always going on. She says, I just wanted to dance. Right. Yeah, I think that I, it was, was open attitude of a lot of people, you know, uh, of her generation. <laughs> I I had a little discussion from uh, uh, Jim's paper, which, uh, by the way, I just love that paper. <laughs> That was, that was just so cool. It, it hit all of my folklorist buttons. I mean, <laughs> not as, as good as it can get. This idea of a local folklorist and the outside folklorist, the inside folklorist and the outside folklorist, if you know what I'm talking about. For example, in, in uh, Joyce Hakala's book, The Rowan Tree, she talks about how Sidney Robertson came in and needed to find, find you know, the people who are singing this music and she had to rely on Marjorie Edgar to do that. And I was thinking about, about me going up to the Kiwana and, and recording people like Jim Lohman, Randy Seppala, and so on, and even Oren Tikkanen. But in, in point of reality, Oren Tikkanen is the local folklorist. His work up there has been to promote the local music, and he loved the local music. And, and, we are, and I was the outside folklorist. You see what I'm saying? The insider and the outsider. It was a little something I heard on Hilary Virtanen's paper today. I was thinking about that. When I interviewed Jim Lohman, he said, you know, I will never be a youper, even though I've lived here 30 years. I said, what do you mean by that? He says, well, you know, you've got to have deeper roots. He said, but my daughter, my daughter was born here. Now she's a real youper. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I think that that's, that's really important to understand and to have a lot of that respect that it takes between the, the local folklorist, the local person who's the catalyst person putting together things who really knows where they are, and then the outsider who uh, it truly is an outsider, maybe doesn't know the people personally. What do you think there, Jim? No, I think you're absolutely right. And uh, I, uh, I'm i certainly an outsider in, in the, uh, I'm at least uh, from an area that was imagined as part of the great state of Superior. I'm, I'm a Jack, Jack Pine Savage from Northern Wisconsin, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but not a youper. So I, I uh, you know, <laughs> no, I, I think you're right. You, you know, if there are people on, on the ground, uh, it's, it's vital to, to get to know them and work with them and also support in any way you can what, what they're doing as well, uh, which yeah. in the case of Oren and Mike, Michael Wolkinen, who I, I in both of whom I invoked, you know, they've done spectacularly valuable work and are, are still doing that. And yeah, don't forget about Hillary too. Yes, know? yes. Well, I was talking Who's about- Who's a native music, born folklorist yes. right there on the spot. I mean, that- Right on. Better than yeah, that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary Burton in it. Finlandia, shout out. <laughs> well, and it, it amazes me too when you think of the work that Dorson and, and and Lomax did over here. You couldn't imagine two guys less youper. Um, you know, <laughs> Dorson being this this uh, New England uh, blue blood um, from Exeter and and Harvard and and. Yeah. Uh, and and Lomax is Texan boy, you know, from Washington D.C. And yet they were really, really good at getting people to open up and yeah, and they collected a lot of work. But I know they had a lot of informants too, which helped. Yeah, one of your relatives, right, uh, for for Dorson. <laughs> yeah, my grandfather. He interviewed my grandfather. He yeah. got a couple stories out of him. He didn't use them in the book, uh, but um, yeah, but he was so good at finding these people. You know, how the heck did he find my grandfather? I don't know. Well, he yeah, he clearly uh, rolled his sleeves up. Now, Dorson did have the advantage of of having taught at what was then the Michigan State Teachers College for a while, and uh, you know now Michigan State University, and so he had students in his classes who were youpers, and uh, in his mm -hmm. book uh, Bloodstoppers and Bearwalkers, you know he he uh, acknowledges them some, and then uh, also writes about the. In the mysterious trek, uh, you know, across the, this was before the bridge was built to this uh, you know, strange land, this wild <laughs> land uh, up there in, in the 1940s. And, um, you know, there's no real clear evidence that, that he was aware of Alan Lomax's work there um, almost a decade before, but, um, he visited some of the same people who turn up in Lomax's notebooks, and they both uh, offered similar assessments of the amazing vitality and variety of folklore in the UP, uh, although Lomax emphasizing music and uh, Dorson emphasizing narrative and storytelling traditions. And, and it's interesting too, Carl, because you mentioned um, Joyce Hockela's fantastic book on yeah. uh, Finnish, um, Finnish music in, in, in Minnesota and the work of, of Marjorie Edgar, who uh, was a Minnesotan, but not, not a Finn. And uh, Sidney Robertson made recordings uh, as a Californian yeah. <laughs> in the region during <laughs> Depression era stuff when Charles Seeger had hired her uh, and, she was stationed in, in the region. But it, Marjorie Edgar was active in the Girl Scouts. And so her Finnish we're, contacts we're were- We're gonna have to close it up right now. Yeah, okay. Sessions about okay. to start. No, you're right. But I will we'll, say, we'll leave it there. Read Joyce's book. <laughs> read Joyce's book. And if you wanna know more, contact these guys. You can find them online. 
Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, gentlemen. And uh, we're turning it over. Jessica Cruz is going to be uh, leading the next session. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. I'm honored.